Chapter Two of *The City at World's End* by Edmund Hamilton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. *The City at World's End*, Chapter Two, The Incredible. The rest of the staff was waiting for them when they came back into the lab grounds. A dozen men, ranging in age from Creasy to Old Bites, were standing shivering in the chill red sunlight in front of the building. Johnson was with them, waiting for his answer. Hubble looked at him and at the others. He said, "'I think we'd better go inside.' They did not ask the questions that were clamoring inside them. Silently, with the jerky, awkward movements of men strung so taut that the reflex centers no longer functioned smoothly, they followed Hubble through the doorway. Keniston went with them, but not all the way. He turned aside, toward his own office, and said, "'I've got to find out if Carol is all right.' Hubble said sharply, "'Don't tell her yet, Ken. Not yet.' "'No,' said Keniston. "'No, I won't.' He went into the small room and closed the door. The telephone was on his desk and he reached for it, and then he drew his hand away. The fear had altered now into a kind of numbness, as though it were too large to be contained within a human body, and had ebbed away, carrying with it all the substances of strength and will as water carries sand. He looked at the black, familiar instrument and thought how improbable it was that there should still be telephones and fat books beside them with quantities of names and numbers belonging to people who had lived once in villages and nearby towns, but who were not there any more, not since—how long? An hour or so, if you figured it one way, if you figured it another. He sat down in the chair behind the desk. He had done a lot of hard work sitting in that chair, and now all that work had ceased to matter. Quite a lot of things had ceased to matter plans, and ideas, and where you were going to on your honeymoon, and exactly where you wanted to live, and in what kind of house. Florida and California and New York were words as meaningless as yesterday and tomorrow. They were gone, the times and the places, and there wasn't anything left of them but Carol herself, and maybe even Carol wasn't left. Maybe she'd been out with her aunt for a little drive in the country and if she wasn't in Middletown when it happened, she's gone, gone, gone." He took the phone in both hands and set a number over and over into it. The operator was quite patient with him. Everybody in Middletown seemed to be calling someone else, and over the roar and click of the exchange and the ghostly confusion of voices he heard the pounding of his own blood in his ears and he thought that he did not have any right to want Carol to be there, and he ought to be praying that she had gone somewhere, because why would he want anybody he loved to have to face what was ahead of them? And what was ahead of them? How could you guess which one, out of all the shadowy formless horrors that might be? Ken, said a voice in his ear, Ken, is that you? Hello? Carol, he said. The room turned misty around him, and there was nothing anywhere but that voice on the line. "'I've been trying and trying to get you, Ken. What on earth happened? The whole town is excited. I saw a terrible flash of lightning, but there wasn't any storm. And then that quake. Are you all right?' "'Sure, I'm fine.' She wasn't really frightened yet. Anxious, upset, but not yet frightened a flash of lightning, and a quake. Alarming, yes, but not terrifying, not the end of the world. He caught himself up hard. He said, I don't know yet what it was. Can you find out? Somebody must know. She did not guess, of course, that Keniston was an atomic physicist. He had not been allowed to tell that to anyone, not even his fiancée. To her, he was merely a research technician in an industrial laboratory, vaguely involved with test tubes and things. She had never questioned him very closely about his work, apparently content to leave all that up to him, and he had been grateful, because it had spared him the necessity of lying to her. Now he was even more grateful, because she would not dream that he might have special information. 
That way he could spare her a little longer, get himself in hand before he told her. "'I'll do my best,' he told her. "'But until we're sure, I wish you and your aunt would stay in the house off the street. No, I don't think your bridge luncheon will come off anyway. And you can't tell what people will do when they're frightened. Promise? Yes, yes. I'll be over as soon as I can." He hung up, and as soon as that contact with Carol was broken, reality slipped away from him again. He looked around the office, and it became suddenly rather horrible, because it had no longer any meaning. He had an urgent wish to get out of it, yet when he rose he stood for some while with his hands on the edge of the desk, going over Hubble's words in his mind, remembering how the sun had looked, and the stars, and the sad, alien earth knowing that it was all impossible but unable to deny it. The long haul of time and a shattering force. He wanted desperately to run away, but there was no place to run to. Presently he went down the corridor to Hubble's office. They were all there, the twelve men of the staff and Johnson. Johnson had gone by himself into a corner. He had seen what lay out there beyond the town and the others had not. He was trying to understand it, to understand the fact and the explanation of it he had just heard. It was not a pleasant thing to watch him try. Keniston glanced at the others. He had worked closely with these men. He had thought he knew them all so well, having seen them under stress, in the moments when their work succeeded and the others when it did not. Now he realized that they were all strangers, to him and to each other alone and wary with their personal fears. Old Bites was saying, almost truculently, "'Even if it were true, you can't say exactly how long a time has passed. Not just from the stars.' Hubble said, "'I'm not an astronomer, but anyone can figure it from the tables of known star motions and the change in the constellations. Not exactly, no, but as close as will ever matter.' But. If the continuum were actually shattered, if this town has actually jumped millions of years—" Byte's voice trailed off. His mouth began to twitch, and he seemed suddenly bewildered by what he was saying, and he and all of them stood looking at Hubble in a haunted silence. Hubble shook his head. "'You won't really believe until you see for yourselves. I don't blame you. But in the meantime, you'll have to accept my statement as a working hypothesis." Morrow cleared his throat and asked, "'What about the people out there, the town? Are you going to tell them?' "'They'll have to know at least part of it,' Hubble said. "'It'll get colder, very much colder by night, and they'll have to be prepared for it. But there must not be any panic. The mayor and the chief of police are on their way here now, and we'll work it out with them." "'Do they know yet themselves?' asked Keniston, and Hubble said, "'No.' Johnson moved abruptly. He came up to Hubble and said, "'I don't get all this scientific talk about space and time. What I want to know is, is my boy safe?' Hubble stared at him. "'Your boy?' He went out to Martinson's farm early to borrow a cultivator. It's two miles out North Road. What about him, Mr. Hubble? Is he safe?" That was the secret agony that had been writing him, the one he had not voiced. Hubble said gently, "'I would say that you don't have to worry about him at all, Johnson.' Johnson nodded, but still looked worried. He said, "'Thanks, Mr. Hubble. I'd better go back now. I left my wife in hysterics." A minute or two after he left, Keniston heard a siren scream outside. It swung into the lab-yard and stopped. That, said Hubble, would be the mayor. A small and infirm reed to lean upon, thought Keniston, at a time like this. There was nothing particularly wrong about Mayor Garris. He was no more bumbling, inefficient, or venal than the average mayor of any average small city. He liked banquets and oratory, he worried about the right necktie, and he was said to be a good husband and father. But Keniston could not somehow picture Bertram Garris shepherding his people safely across the end of the world. 
He thought so even less when Garrus came in, his bones well padded with the plump pink flesh of good living, his face the perfect pattern of the successful little man who was pleased with the world and his place in it. Just now he was considerably puzzled and upset, but also rather elated at the prospect of something important going on. Keimer, the chief of police, was another matter. He was a large angular man with a face that had seen many grimy things and had learned from them a hard kind of wisdom. Not a brilliant man, Keniston thought, but one who could get things done. And he was worried, far more worried than the mayor. Garris turned immediately to Hubble. It was obvious that he had a great respect for him and was proud to be on an equal footing with such an important person as one of the nation's top atomic scientists. "'Is there any news yet, Dr. Hubble? We haven't been able to get a word from outside, and the wildest rumors are going around. I was afraid at first that you might have had an explosion here in the laboratory, but—' Keimer interrupted him. "'Talk is going around that an atomic bomb hit here, Dr. Hubble. Some of the people are getting scared. If enough of them get to believe it, we'll have a panic on our hands. I've got our officers on the street soothing them down, but I'd like to have a straight story they'll believe." "'Atomic bomb!' said Mayor Harris. "'Preposterous! We're all alive, and there's been no damage. Dr. Hubble will tell you that atomic bombs—' For the second time he was cut short. Hubble broke in sharply. We're not dealing with an ordinary bomb, and the rumors are true as far as they go." He paused and went on more slowly, making every word distinct. A superatomic was exploded an hour ago, for the first time in history, right here. He let that sink in. It was a lingering and painful process, and while it was going on, Keniston looked away, up through the window at the dusky sky and the sullen red sun and felt the knot in his stomach tighten. We were warned, he thought. We were all warned for years that we were playing with forces too big for us. It didn't destroy us, Hubble was saying. We're lucky that way. But it did have certain effects. I don't understand, said the mayor piteously. I simply don't. Certain effects? What? Hubble told him, with quiet bluntness. The mayor and the chief of police of Middletown, normal men of a normal city, adjusted to life in a normal world, listening to the incredible. Listening, trying to comprehend, trying and failing, and rejecting it utterly. "'That's insane!' said Garris angrily. "'Middletown thrown into the future? Why, the very sound of it! What are you trying to do, Dr. Hubble?' He said a great deal more than that. So did Keimer. But Hubble wore them down. Quietly, implacably, he pointed to the alien landscape around the town, the deepening cold, the red, aged sun, the ceasing of all wire and radio communication from the outside. He explained, sketchily, the nature of time and space, and how they might be shattered. His scientific points they could not understand but those they took on faith, the faith which the people of the twentieth century had come to have in the interpreters of the complex sciences they themselves were unable to comprehend. The physical facts they understood well enough, too well, once they were forced to it. It got home at last. Mayor Garris sank down into a chair, and his face was no longer pink, and the flesh sagged on it. His voice was no more than a whimper when finally he asked, "'What are we going to do?' Hubble had an answer ready, to a part of that question at least. "'We can't afford a panic. The people of Middletown will have to learn the truth slowly. That means that none of them must go outside the town yet, or they'd learn at once. I'd suggest you announce the area outside town is possibly radioactive contaminated and forbid anyone to leave." Police Chief Keimer grasped with pathetic eagerness at the necessity of coping with a problem he could comprehend. "'I can put men in barricades at all the street ends to see to that.' 
And our local National Guard company is assembling now at the armory," put in Mayor Garris. His voice was shaky, his eyes still stunned. Hubble asked, "'What about the city's utilities?' "'Everything seems to be working, power, gas, and water,' the mayor answered. They would, Keniston thought. Middletown's coal-steam electric generation plant and its big water tower and its artificial gas plant had all come through time with them. They, and all food and fuel, must be rationed, Hubble was saying. Proclaim it as an emergency measure. Mayor Garris seemed to feel a little better at being told what to do. Yes, we'll do that at once. Then he asked timidly, isn't there any way of getting in touch with the rest of the country?" "'The rest of the country,' Hubble reminded him, "'is some millions of years in the dead past. You'll have to keep remembering that.' "'Yes, of course, I keep forgetting,' said the mayor. He shivered and then took refuge in the task set him. "'We'll get busy at once.' When the car had borne the two away, Hubble looked haggardly at his silent colleagues. They'll talk, of course. But if the news spreads slowly, it won't be so bad. It'll give us a chance to find out a few things first." Crecy began to laugh a little shrilly. If it's true, this is a side-splitting joke. The whole town flung into the end of the world and not even knowing it yet. All these fifty thousand people, not guessing yet that their cousin Agnes in Indianapolis has been dead and dust for a million years. And they mustn't guess, Hubble said. Not yet. Not until we know what we face in this future Earth. He went on, thinking aloud. We need to see what's out there outside the town before we can plan anything. Keniston, will you get a jeep and bring it back here? Bring spare gasoline and some warm clothing, too. We'll need it out there. And Ken, bring two guns. End of chapter 2